Good morning and welcome to this service put out by the Open Bible Baptist Church of Aylmer, Ontario. We're glad that you have joined us for another time of teaching and researching the things in Scripture. Just uh, want to remind you that Open Bible Baptist Church meets outside in the open air under a tent and uh, beside the tent <clears throat> every Sunday morning at 9.30. That service is not recorded. It is in that service where we sing and we have people testify and uh, we give the uh, regular announcements and we have our worship time. So that's our service proper on Sunday morning. Unfortunately, because it's outdoors, we're unable to set up our gear to record it. And so we are doing what we can to record the uh, program for you, at least the message part of it for you at the 1030 hour. Uh, any of you that are close and within driving distance, we would much encourage you to come and join us at 930. It's unrestricted amount of people. Bring your own lawn chair and come and sit under the shade and enjoy the hour at 930 at the Hacienda Road corner of number three in Hacienda Road and uh, come and worship the Lord together with us. We had a very wonderfully pleasant surprise last Sunday when uh, some guests showed up, uh, people that I did not recognize, <clears throat> and to discover that the gentleman and his wife uh, were there to give a word of thanks to the church for the ministry that took place in 1978. It was in 1978 when two of our men came to his door to uh, tell the, him about the Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately he accepted the Lord as his savior and he moved on from there, landed up another part of Southern Ontario and discovered that we were online. And so he has connected with us and came to give thanks for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with him in 1978. That's a long time ago, but uh, we so much appreciated hearing that and just recently, somebody from Winnipeg connected with us just to give a word of appreciation because uh, I was their pastor back in uh, 1982 to 83 thereabouts, and they moved on from Newfoundland to Winnipeg. And so uh, they've been periodically tuning in, and they just wanted to let us know that they too appreciate the ministry that's going forward. So these are good news from people that we had no idea uh, of what was happening in their lives. Perhaps there are some things happening in your life and you have not yet let us know and you've not responded. Well, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, even just a little, we're watching or we're enjoying or we're learning or God is speaking to us through this or anything. We just love to hear from you. So uh, sometimes it's just difficult speaking into a camera when you don't have a live audience and you don't know what the responses are. And uh, so any kind of note from you uh, would be just so much appreciated. And we'd be happy if you have some serious biblical questions or questions that relate to life and family, we'd be happy to speak with you and try to be of some help to you. Well, it has been my joy in the last several weeks to study the book of Galatians together with our listening audience. Uh, we preach exactly the same message, the same passage on our outdoor service as we do on the online service. So either way, whether you are at the meeting or whether you are privately watching in your home or wherever you happen to be, uh, you get the same message. There's, there's a difference in preaching to the live audience than there is to a camera. And uh, so I'm trying to do my best to imagine that you're there. But, uh, but we're glad that you have joined us, and we're going to go to Galatians chapter 4 this morning, and we're going to be talking about a heart-searching allegory. A heart-searching allegory. Uh, you might say, what is an allegory? Well, those of you who studied grammar, which is kind of a rare thing these days, but grammar actually was a big thing when we were young people, and we were required to know... Uh, so many facets of the language itself that we speak and that we hold dear. 
uh, one of the things that we studied was uh, allegory and uh, the fables and the legends and various things and what distinguishes them, what makes one different from another. Well, I have news for you. There's only one time that the word allegory shows up in the scriptures. And whether it shows up in other translations, I don't really know because I didn't take the time to check it. But I did check from, from the regular Bible that we use, the King James Bible, and it is in that Bible where we find the word allegory. And you might want to know that an allegory is nothing but an extended metaphor. Uh, it, it has characters, uh, it has setting, it has objects, it has plot points, and uh, it's, it means something beyond the literal. So it takes from a literal setting with real people and genuine circumstances and applies them to a greater truth. And so that is what essentially an allegory is. Now I have a question about this for you. Uh, is, there, uh, is there symbolism in the Bible? Well, yes there is. There is the term of Abraham's bosom. Uh, that just simply meant that someone was close to Abraham uh, there was the, uh, the beasts that are recorded in many portions of Scripture. You have Daniel, Ezekiel, uh, you have Revelation, you've got beasts, and they exemplify something. They symbolize uh, something other than just beasts. You have uh, the candles and the candlesticks of the book of the Revelation. Well, God uses the term candle or candlestick because the church is to be the light of the world, and so the lit candle would represent that. And so it's a representation of something that is real. And then you have the dragon in the scriptures. Well, the Bible doesn't propose that there were dragons, there will be dragons flying through the air. That has reference to Satan. And there are many other such things that are symbols and oftentimes metaphors. Now, if the Bible mentions one allegory, and it does, is it then reasonable to develop an entire system of interpretation uh, known as the allegorical method of interpreting Scripture? Well, whether we know this or understand it or not, the truth is that much of today's preaching is done in allegorical manner, especially when it comes to the prophetic books, because there is symbolism, because there are representations of something that you have to figure out, does not give license to interpret Adam and Eve to be something other than the first human parents. It does not give a license to interpret the events of the 40 years wandering as an experience that every Christian goes through. Uh, the allegorical method of interpretation is nifty, if you like that word. It can be interesting because it just depends on the imagination of the mind of the speaker. I'm not too thrilled with the imagination of the mind of the speaker unless his mind is connected to what the scripture actually says. And so it has been my contention and my belief and along with many others who are scholars in the scriptures who maintain that what the author said the author meant. If that doesn't make any sense, then you have to figure out what it was that he said. Jesus oft times used parables, and the disciples said, Lord, we don't know what you're saying. We don't understand this. And Jesus explained it to them. And he said, to you is given the ability to understand the mysteries of the kingdom, but not to others. So there were some things that needed explanation, some things that needed interpretation. But usually, as in the parables, Jesus gives the interpretation along with the complexity of the parable. This allegory that we find in the book of Galatians chapter 4, 
gives us the meaning of the allegory. It states the allegory, but the meaning follows. And so therefore, we're not guessing as to what this is. We're discovering what it is. We are researching what it is and find it to be a heart-searching challenge. Beginning at verse number 21 today, I want us to read that verse only to start with. Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? This is the piercing question. Paul has been seeking to correct the Galatian believers from the error of departure from the gospel of pure grace to a mixture of works and grace and where works would take the predominant lead in their philosophical minds and in their religious observances. The piercing question then is, uh, are, uh, do you want do you want to follow the law? Do you want to be under the works of the law? That was the question. Now, I'd like to ask you today as to whether law observance connected to everything the Old Testament teaches, is this something that would be desirable in your life? And I would expect that probably 99 to 100% of my listeners would say, no, I do not want to be under the restrictions and the guidance and the demands and the punishments of the law. But these Galatian people had subjected themselves to this. For us, it would mean that we would subject ourselves to becoming better Christians by works, or as the old Platonic philosophy set forward, the duty and the demands of duty that makes us better people. Well, in some cases that might be true, but if we're going to be looking at the law, Paul asks the second question that follows through on the first one, and that is, those of you who say that you want to be under the works of the law, have you ever heard the law? Have you actually studied the law? Have you actually sought to observe every facet of the law? The answer, of course, is rhetorical, but I'm sure that Paul got some answers. We are not told what those answers were from the people who were being challenged by this question, but the Apostle Paul is asking them whether they'd actually come to know what the law was about. Well, there are a lot of them. The law is not only the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments wraps up so much, the, the, such a huge portion of the law, but there are things that the Ten Commandments do not explicitly say, and so therefore there was an addition of everything from Genesis to Deuteronomy that became the law with over 600 guiding uh, teachments. You find them in the chapters of the Bible. And so the question was, do you know the law, or have you listened to the law, have you heard the law? So those who put themselves under the law may be doing so ignorantly. They may be doing so presumptively because they don't really know the law. Even the most orthodox of the Jewish people who would by far exceed in knowledge in reference to the law, there's a challenge as to whether they've actually heard the law, whether they've actually seen the demands of the law and what the requirements of the law actually were. Well, that's what Galatians has been about. Paul said so very clearly that the law could not possibly save anyone because it was not intended to save us. It was intended for guidance for Jewish life in the old economy. It was intended to show us our shortcoming. And the New Testament tells us that we have all come short of the glory of God, so that to reach perfection would be glory, but we've come short of the glory. 
because if we have violated the law in one point only, we have become the breakers of the law and are guilty of all, the scripture tells us consistently. So these people were confused. They believed that going back to law observance would make them better, it would make them stronger, whereas the Apostle Paul is challenging them, saying, what part of the law are you actually referring to? What part of works is actually going to make you a Christian? What part of works will make you a better Christian? Oh, there are things that we're responsible for in our Christian lives, but we're not responsible to follow under the guidance of the law as a matter of works for redemption, for sanctification, for perfection, or for ultimate hope. And so I want us to move on to verses 22 through 26, and I want us to look at the two historic persons who define our faith. If you look at verse 22, we read, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond maid, the other by a free woman, but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. And that's where you have that one time reference in the scriptures to an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which genders to bondage, which is Agar or Hagar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So I just want you just to think along with me just for a moment here. I want us to think of a very real person in biblical history. We have reference here to Sarah, very real, referenced in Hebrews 11 as a woman who challenged the promise of God by laughter and yet was honored after she received the rebuke. There's another real person and that was Hagar. She was the housekeeper, the nanny, the caretaker of the home of Abraham and Sarah, even though they had no children, but somehow she still tended to the responsibilities of the house, which tells us that the social status for Abraham and Sarah must have been relatively lucrative and high, but Hagar was the servant girl and then there was another real person, and his name was Abraham. Well, what we discover in this portion of Scripture is that Abraham had two sons. One came from Sarah. I should reverse that because one came from Hagar, and then the other one came from Sarah. Sarah and Abraham represent the historic judeo Christian faith. Now, when I was 19 years of age, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. He saved me because I received him. He adopted me into his family, as we find in Galatians chapter 4 as well, and I was grateful. Changed my life from what I was to something new, New hopes, new desires, new associations, new direction, peace and quietness, enjoying the forgiveness that had been given to me by the God who loved me. But entering into Bible college and studying for four years gave me some insights that I had not had before. When I received Christ as my Savior, I did not even know that there was anything significant about a Jew except that there were negative comments about them. I did not know much. I didn't know how to defend them. I had no idea really of what this was all about. So I paid no attention to the Jew. 
Well, in studying the scripture, and folks, if you do study the scripture from cover to cover, you cannot help but be confronted by Israel. This will happen regularly. People who do not mention or teach Israel as a major part of scripture are overlooking far too much. And so when I first heard the Campbell Reese team uh, come to the Saskatchewan area where we were, and Ken Campbell then preached on the Judeo-Christian faith. My ears perked up and I said, this is something that I really need to study further. We studied about Israel and the Jew and their future in college. But to hear an evangelist talk about the Judeo-Christian faith, I was just kind of trying to figure this out. Is Christianity and Jewishness the same? Well, the Galatians had a little bit of that problem. The only thing was that they were reverting to the law of the Jews that God had demanded of them, but they were not understanding that the Jews were used of God to bring into the world the blessing promised to Abraham and ultimately the birth of the Son of God who would come to take away our sin and also promise us an eternal future. Without the historic Israel, without the historic Jews, we would not have a true message of the Savior. Well, you don't have to know that to get saved. I did not know that to get saved. But Abraham and his wife Sarah represent that historic Judeo-Christian faith. Don't go being a anti-Jew person. Don't go being an anti-Israel person. Don't be a denial of Israel's protection and blessing and future from God. Because you might be attacking the very foundations of the faith that we have, the faith that is in Jesus Christ. These are represented by Abraham and by Sarah. Hagar and Abraham represent the historic Arabian nations. So we have now before us some historical matters. We have first the uh, significance and the prominence of the Jewish world by Abraham, by the prophets, and ultimately by our Savior Jesus Christ. Those who are in the news today who are crying against a white savior, I don't know of anybody who talks about a white savior, maybe some do, but I'm not aware of them. Jesus Christ was not a white man, Jesus Christ was Jewish by, by design, by the design of God. God was not Jewish in heaven, but he put Jesus into the womb of a Jewish girl and he ministered in Israel. This is very significant. We don't talk about a white savior. We don't talk about a black savior. We don't talk about a brown savior. We talk about the savior of the world, period. That's it. And there's no other identification needed to identify him except that he's the Holy Son of God. So we have the Jewish world, but also we have the Arabian world. Significant it was that President Trump actually was able to make an arrangement of agreement between the Arabs and the Jews. This was historic. Very few men under the sun would have been capable to make such an accomplishment as the Abrahamic Accord. This message is not designed to be political or in support of anyone, but it might just be that some people missed the cue and did not understand some of the greater purposes and the decisions that were made. We must move on and look at the parable parallels of this allegory. And we find this in verse 24. We read, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which dangers to bondage, which is Hagar. So I want you to think of this. Sarah is the mother of the faith child. Hagar is the mother of the works child. Abram and Sarah had limited faith. The hope of having a son 
the hope of being the father of many nations was diminishing. Was our faith put in something that wasn't real? Was our faith maybe misunderstood? Did we understand? And they're approaching a hundred years of age. And so the logical thing to do is to help God out. I was mentioning in our Bible study as we teach the eschatology and the prophecy on Wednesday nights, I was teaching that when the rapture comes, God won't need any of our help. I mentioned to the folks that I can jump, but I can only jump a little bit, and it's only a matter of a split second and my feet touch the ground again. If I were to help in the rapture, it would be futile. The rapture is something that God does. He takes us out of here. Well, the same thing was true in reference to this. Abraham said, I'm going to have to help God out. I don't know that he did consciously so, but maybe he did. Sarah said, look, you and I have not been able to have children and we're beyond the childbearing years. So there's Hagar, she's a younger woman. Why don't you take her into your bedroom and why don't you have a child? Can you imagine any woman saying that to her husband? And when uh, this comes to light, wow, what trouble. In any case, Hagar was the works child concept. Abraham and Sarah, in their limited faith, said, we trust God, but we can't maybe trust completely. Abraham and Hagar had only human genius with no faith. They orchestrated a plan, designed it, and executed it. But it was a plan that was not of God. It was a plan that was in the mind of human beings. So these human beings were used of God, but in this case, not. In this case, it was human effort. And so because of the human effort of Hagar and Abraham with Sarah as the one who introduced the subject, you've got problems. Problems that began in the marriage, problems that followed through with the children's relationships, problems that followed through with national issues, and problems that have resulted in international issues. This would have never happened if Abraham and Sarah had simply obeyed God and believed the promise. But because the matter of works got involved, things were messed up in a very big way. And every time a Christian steps aside from grace to works, he'll mess up. There are going to be problems. You see, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the apostle wrote, but without faith it is impossible to please God. Abraham and Sarah and Hagar did not exercise faith. They exercised what they could do to help fulfill the promise of God. And God was not pleased. He said, without faith you cannot please God, for he that comes to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Sarah represents Jerusalem, which represents Israel past, present, and future as free. Hagar represents Mount Sinai, a system of perfection beyond human reach, which put humanity into bondage. So you have the free woman, the son of the free woman, you have the woman of bondage, the servant girl, representing that which brings people into bondage. That's what the allegory is about. Those are the parallels. Now look at the persecutions resulting from human genius. In verse number 28 we read, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. And so we've got, first of all, we have the privilege of promise. In verse 29, we have the pattern of persecution. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. The churches in Galatia were being injured. They're being intimidated. 
They were being put down by those who had become legalistic followers of the law that they did not know and did not understand, but they became critical of others. And as Paul said, as it was then, so it is now. And I want you to know that spirit is alive and well in churches and in communities today. Churches need to be aware that this is not something that we can entertain or that we can just ignore and overlook. But it is unfortunately something that does happen. And then there is the priority of purification in verse 30. And if you look at that verse carefully, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Reading it in the Old Testament context, it seems like a cruel action. But what had happened was destroying Abraham's family, and he could not have his family destroyed. Action had to be taken. And so God said to Abraham, you're going to have to let Hagar and her son go. They're not really what I intended for you in the first place. Let them go. There are things in our lives, folks, that we have to let go. We cannot hold on to things that weaken us. We cannot hold on to things that make us less in faith and behavior and testimony. We have to let those things go. Purification from the things that harm us are essential priorities in the scripture. And so in conclusion, let me just remind you that we are either the products of grace or works, but not both. You cannot be saved by being catechized, by being baptized, by being church members, by obeying certain rules of the church. This does not save you. There is no salvation in human effort. You're the product of the grace of God, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. If you and I have any part of doing in our salvation, we could brag, but we have nothing to brag about. We're only humble sinners that come to Jesus in repentance and faith and crying out to him and saying, Lord Jesus, save me, for I cannot save myself. And if you think you can save yourself, you're going to fall short. No matter how well behaved you might become, no matter how hard you try, no matter how many tears you shed, until you accept the pure grace of God for your salvation, you can never reach heaven. It is grace, grace alone. You believe and you trust and that's all that you can do. The law-abiding believer becomes harmfully critical of believers who do not follow the law. If you do not follow my standards of faith, then you're a compromiser. If you do not follow my standards of belief, then you don't amount to anything. Folks, there are so many things I could say about that. But I want you to know this. We have to stop measuring ourselves by what others do, say, or think. We have to measure ourselves against the grace of God. And that alone is the standard. That's it. There is no other standard. All other standards are not superficial, they're harmful, they're evil, and they do not help. There's a sharp demand by the Apostle Paul. I read this in closing. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. You as a Christian, you belong to Jesus. Jesus Christ is your Savior. Do you have claims to anything else? Any other claim needs to be cast out. Any other claim is inferior, inadequate, insufficient, and even evil. Your faith must be Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Savior, my God, my coming King. Is this your testimony? And in closing, let me just remind you to please contact me if you have any other needs that you have, whether you need to get saved, follow the Lord in baptism, or 
there are some issues that you're dealing with, you will see the name, the number, and the contact information on the screen, and we welcome your feedback. God bless you, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.